Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the SoFi Weekly Podcast. Galileo unveiled a new product this week called Buy Now, Pay Later Post Purchase, allowing to consolidate purchases that you've already made into short-term loans. Not, not that this is being offered at SoFi, but this is being offered to the Galileo customers. Do you think that this is going to be a product that's in demand? So Buy Now, Pay Later grew rapidly. I, I don't remember the exact statistics, but I remember looking at it closely just because I'm a PayPal investor. Um, that's one of the reasons why a firm spiked the way it did. It just, and everywhere I went, at least down here in Houston area, Buy Now, Pay Later was offered everywhere. Like Klarna just really went for it. This was due to not some sort of innovation, but the fact that you can apply and get Buy Now, Pay Later very easily even if you are over leveraged with debt. And so it's just another le lever that people could push to be able to meet the, that holiday greed, uh, which maybe they couldn't really afford. And so there's probably some folks that are over leveraged. Um, we won't know that for a little while. Um, I know that there's a lot of services that are like the pay and for that PayPal has that you just make those four monthly payments and you're done. There's a lot that offer uh, longer terms as well. And so if quite a few people overdid it over the holiday season, like this is basically the perfect time to launch is what I'm saying. Uh, because those payments, uh, people might be thinking, oh, man, you know, I, I have more money coming late in the later half of the year for whatever reason, but just I need to spread out these payments, make them smaller, even if it costs me more in the long term. And people are willing to do that. I, I don't know that it's going to be more than a niche product, but it could grow into something more. We'll have to see. But I, I, I don't think that there's going to be zero demand. I think it's the perfect timing for this. I, I think about a lot like uh, Dave, one of our customers. But one of the products that they offer is cash advances. It's one of their biggest products. And I think that you may see them roll out buy now, pay later, post-purchase because they are really, really into these very small dollar amount loans. So a couple of points. Number one, it seems like Galileo is putting more of their product innovation, product roadmap behind buy now, pay later. They even mentioned in that press release that buy now, pay later is forecasted to surpass 900 million global users by 2027. That's in three years. There's big bets behind buy now, pay later. They had a list of benefits in their press release. And the first one was market differentiation. And the second one was an entry point into lending for fintech specifically. It just further deepens the moat for Galileo. It makes their consolidated offering way more unique for these financial institutions. And it widens the net of potential targets that they can go after because it's an entry point into that lending offering specifically. Yeah. Have you seen many Galileo customers rolling out buy now, pay later since the first announcement? No, which is what makes me surprised that they're like, I think this is like the third or the fourth product announcement around buy now, pay later since they launched the, the buy now, pay later sure. offering in the place like back in the fall. The other thing uh, you know, I wanted to mention is, and I feel like I talk about Galileo product announcements like on a weekly basis, if not definitely on a bi-weekly basis, like every other week. And I just feel as though the pace of technology and product releases far out surpasses the pace that SoFi releases new technology, mm -hmm. new developments. Like SoFi, it feels like we've been waiting on Zelle for like three years. It feels like we've been waiting on you know, the invest app for quite a while, the UI feels like level we've been one. level one options for so yeah. long. And, and it's like, meanwhile, Galileo and David Foyer, their chief product officer, they're just rolling out Galileo stuff every week, every two weeks. And so the reason why that thought came into my mind to compare the two is because of Jeremy Richel, who keeps selling stock every three months, every chance he gets. I know that people sell for many different reasons. I understand that. It's just interesting to contrast those two leads on the tech side of the business, because at the end of the day, it's one company culture, right? One company sort of umbrella, one vision, one direction. And meanwhile, you have one division, Galileo, which is operating at a much, much quicker speed from a releases perspective than what SoFi is. And, and it's nice to see from one hand, but on the other hand, SoFi needs to get like the core SoFi offering, the B2C offering needs to get their ass in gear and roll out some more stuff on the tech platform side of things. Because for as long as they don't, users are going to be pissed off and it's going to be more of a spotlight put on people like Jeremy Rischel and the entire tech platform and even Anthony Nota himself. I put this out. Uh, so UK uh, launch for Robinhood. They don't have options yet. 
And on the same day, the CTO sold more. And I agree with Tevis. I, I think innovation and, and implementation is slow, lacking, not done very well under SoFi. Like Galileo is great. Uh, Technicist, that's harder to get a gauge on, but it seems like it's fine. I don't think he's doing a good job at all. And I'm not mad at him about selling stock. And so I threw this poll out. I'm like, hey, it's the same day. It's kind of related. Which happens first? SoFi actually gets level one options, finally, which literally they've lost customers on the invest platform. Uh, Data-driven investing was one of those where they're like, hey, I just can't. I need the level one options. I don't know when they're coming. Supposedly they're coming. Or will Robinhood launch options in the UK, which by the way, there's like two companies that have level one options in the UK. It's very hard to do. It's very hard to get. And I would think you know, it should be a very simple thing for SoFi to do this. But I think that there's an honest chance that Robinhood launches level one options in the UK before SoFi does here in the United States. And that's not acceptable. Rochelle, uh, uh, Jeremy Rischel, he needs to just leave. He does this every four years. And he, I was looking at his, you know, resume and I, I, I have a few different pieces where you could see like internally what people were commenting on on him and going on the blind was one of those that was pretty interesting just to see people's opinion when he was at Splunk. He was not known as an innovator. He was not well liked. And that's kind of the reputation he had with several companies. I don't think he's bad. I just don't think he's great. And they could do better. You know, get, get rid of this guy. Just say, hey, you've served your time. Great. Uh, take your stock and go and uh, bring in somebody else. He might end up leaving. Who knows? It's hard well, to see why there's certain names for certain executive positions. And I don't really uh, fault him for selling. I think some information came out about Jeremy recently, and it might need to be a change of executive team. But So Jeremy Richel sold 56,000 shares this week. This was in addition to the sales last week, which was for tax reasons. He just sold more. And he was like the only executive that sold more. I have the form for what you'll see here is you know 56,000 shares at $6.93. He only has about 390,000 shares left. I mean, I know they get more shares every year as like when they invest. He's definitely burning through his total share count because he sells every couple of months, every three months or so he sells. I have the sales over here. And so here you can see just how frequently he's been selling. He sold this month and then exactly three months ago and December 21st, he sold. And then three months before that, he sold and four months before that and then two months before that. So every quarter, this guy is dropping shares regardless of what the price is. He sold at $5.47 and he sold as high as $9.78. But it doesn't really matter. Like he's selling about you know, anywhere between half a million to a million per quarter. And so, yeah, there could be personal reasons why he's selling, but he's not really leaving too many shares left in his name. I mean, 390,000 shares, even when he went down to 100,000, like I said, they get granted more. So right now he has 390,000. Even then, like he, he just unloads huge amounts. He sold 200,000 shares back here in 2023 in, in May. He sold 13% of his stake. I'm sure he's going to get more shares as a result of being a chief technology officer, but every quarter to be selling 50,000 share blocks, you contrast that with somebody like Noto, they're buying 50,000 share blocks every quarter. Yeah, I, I don't really care, you know, if they sell or not. I'm hoping that it's like uh, Webster when he was leaving or when, when SoFi basically demoted him, put someone else in his position, he started selling aggressively and that's fine. I mean, you, you don't have to hold on to the shares. And so sometimes that can indicate that you're leaving. If that's the case, God bless him. I hope he sells all of his shares and he is gone. My issue with him is I just think the, the, the actual product itself, the SoFi platform is not living up to um, the quality that uh, you need to have. And it could be that there's somebody else that's an issue, but if you're the CTO, the buck stops with you. And so I know uh, Galileo is doing well with Derek White. I, I think that he's pretty incredible. It's because people see the tech aspect of SoFi as lagging, and they have for several years, that they now put a heavier scrutiny on Jeremy Rischel selling. Nobody's saying anything about Lauren Stafford Webb selling because the marketing for SoFi, the PR, all of that initiative, the comms, are, they're all on point. Face of Finance campaign, the the SoFi money moves, like SoFi Stadium, all of these things are all on point. And so we understand, I think, as a retail investor community that people sell for all kinds of reasons, but it's because it's compounded by the fact that that side of SoFi's business is seen by large part as a weak point that people are like, oh, let's put two and two together here.
I think whenever you're talking about one specific person, things happen in people's lives, who knows what's going on. It doesn't really bother me. Like I want to see the actual financials of the company. If the innovation slowing on the tech side is going to be meaningful, like there are serious gaps between us and our competitors, then we're going to see that pop up in new member growth or organic member growth, something like that. You know, if you monitor a Robinhood versus SoFi from a customer satisfaction standpoint, not just the, on the product standpoint, very heavily favored in a SoFi side. So people can say one thing about the product and another way, whenever you're trying to look up that product, people seem more satisfied at SoFi, which could lead to more organic growth. Let's talk about the Gary Gordon interview a little bit. What did you guys think of some of his fair points? How does it change your opinion of SoFi? It doesn't. Oh, if I didn't get mad, I'm just like, this guy's saying the exact same thing. He said he looked more in the company. He actually looked at quarter four numbers for a change, which is just mind blowing that you could be so against a company, but you're not even looking at the numbers. He still doesn't have a good handle on the tech platform. His arguments were, were it seemed like they were very limited. And then it was just incredible that, you know, looking at the value of SoFi right now and the way they're executing, where he's gone from kind of neutral bearish to, to the point where he's like, hey, I think this would be an incredible short, low seven bucks. Come on. He said that off camera. He said that he was leaning more towards shorting it, but needs to know more about the company. And because he doesn't fully understand the tech platform, he's not ready to short it. I know you said last time earlier this week that you're here to just sort of report and get other viewpoints and not really be combative towards their viewpoints. I still think you're fairly soft because the tone in those articles is forward, very confrontational, very direct. But the tone in the interview is him backtracking saying, oh, well, actually, I don't have a position. Oh, well, when I invested in a bank in the 1980s, this happened. And oh, if actually unemployment reaches 5%, if we go through a deep recession, oh, their financials are on this page and Citibank reports them on this other page. And it was hard for me to find them. And dude, these are all bullshit reasons. These are all like, what if scenarios that it's going to affect the entire macro as a whole, the entire banking industry as a blanket. And then you ask them, oh, did you look at the tech platform? He's like, oh, no, not, not yet. I didn't even look at that. Did you look at financial services that are growing 75%? Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but defaults. And I'm like, dude, they're the same recycled arguments that don't hold up yet still these articles come out that say sell or four dollar price target five dollar price target and i just think that that's the opportunity to actually hammer home those points and i don't know gary and i'm sure he's a great guy but it seems as though it sounded like he had a real chip on his shoulder with regards to growth stocks because of what happened with open door and redfin and 2021 all of these things got super pumped up he's using traditional book value to compare sofi and really discounting the growth, discounting everything that management is saying. If management says, oh, we're actually going to come at higher targets in Wall Street, we know that it's going to be even higher than that. Anthony Noto in his uh, Kramer interview dropped 60 million now as a new number. Meanwhile, we were looking at 40 million before. Meanwhile, in January, we didn't even have 40 to 60 million. Every new month, there's new information that comes to light, suggests if you read between the lines, if you take the two extra seconds it takes to put two and two together, you'll notice these guys are going to blow through all analyst estimations, they're going to blow through their own guidance. And Gary does not account a shred of confidence to what management is saying. He's saying that future results may differ greatly from past results, even though management has never given us a single shred of doubt breaking their promises in the past. And so I just think that he's looking at everything from a very pessimistic lens. And that worldview is framed by his historical context of what a bank looked like in the 90s and what the tech bubble looked like in 2000 thousand and what open door did two years ago none of that shit is relevant when you look at sofi as a whole and actually look beneath the hood of how this company is actually executing holistically speaking and what that bull case is extrapolated when you layer in stuff like the tech platform and when you layer in stuff like a tax product or when they bring insurance in-house or when they actually grow financial services to the point where they're actually viable and not just in reinvestment mode. He's looking at all of the negatives, even though there's many holes in those negatives. And then he's saying we should judge SoFi by the metrics that we judge JP Morgan. And then he's saying, oh, I'm actually assigning $0 value to the exact reason why all of these growth investors are investing in SoFi, because he's assigning $0 value to the growth. He's saying that, yeah. oh yeah, they had one quarter of profitability. I don't know if they're ever going to be a next one. And you're like, dude, are you even on this planet? Like, are we, you know, looking at the same company? So Anyways, that's what I think of the Gary Gordon interview. How can you look at the level of execution, their guidance, and what they've done? It wasn't just a one-time fluke that they're profitable. One of you guys mentioned that he, he was shorting Tesla for a while. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the main reason why he's shorting Tesla is just as far as the valuation, it's high. 
and it's just a car company, which we know, like this is not Tesla Weekly, it's not just a, t a car company. Most of the revenues come from that. And so if you ignore completely what Tesla actually is and say it's just a car company, yeah, it's ridiculously overvalued. SoFi is the same thing, that if you're looking at SoFi and you're like, hey, this is just a bank. If you look at their tangible book value, they're a bit, not not even that much, but a bit overvalued. Maybe not even right now. I, I haven't looked in the last couple of weeks because I smashed down. You're ignoring two thirds of the business. That's absolutely ridiculous. I'm sure he's an expert in the field, but the way these businesses have grown is dramatically different than 20 years ago. You cannot use the same principles you're using to judge banks 20 years ago versus now. A significant amount change in 2008, a significant amount change under COVID. You're behind. It's one of those things during the interview, because whenever you're talking with him and you go, okay, well, you know, what do you assign for the growth? And then he says nothing. I'm not going to go on about something that he doesn't have an opinion on. If you attack the people that you're bringing onto the channel, they don't come back. My job is not to sell Gary on SoFi. My job is to make sure that the investments that I'm holding. No, no, no. Hold on. There's like a, a country mile in between selling Gary on SoFi and keeping the conversation factual and honest. You can come on next quarter when SoFi does report profitability for the second time in a row. You will say, hey, Gary, it's two in a row now. Do you think they're going to hit three? And he's going to be like, I don't know. Probably not. Maybe. Who and like He can make that argument in perpetuity until SoFi reaches a top 10 bank valuation. He's going to be like, well, actually, it's still overvalued compared to Wells Fargo. And meanwhile, Wells Fargo could be like underwater. Keep it like intellectually honest. You're not like selling SoFi to Gary. Eventually, there's going to be one winner. So regardless of if he holds a sell rating on Seeking Alpha between the time that we be are, are, are here or a top 10 bank, there's going to be evidence that one is right and the other one's not. I understand, but there's some poor schmuck out there that is reading the latest Gary Gordon article and is selling SoFi as a result of it when that article is based on a false premise. If you're interviewing him and you do know that it's a false premise, it's your moral obligation to call that out. And then it just goes to a conversation of this is why growth is better than value and value is better than growth. If you wanted to not be confrontational with Gary at all, you could have literally not had him on and just read his Seeking Alpha article word for word, because that's exactly the same argument that he provided. But the point of well, having I mean, open dialogue is to present some facts that he's maybe overlooking. I did. He just at some points didn't agree. Like one of the things that he said was the checking and savings account is not a profitable business, but he's looking full year and I'm looking on a quarterly basis and annualizing it. With some of these points, you know, a lot of those points that you made in the follow up video, you know, I, I wish that you held his feet a little bit more to the fire and, and like, well, no, why do you really think this? It was very clear to me what he was doing, where he was cherry picking data to support his argument. And when he was looking at quarter four, he was not looking at quarter four holistically as a company. He was like, what can actually support my argument? Confirmation. I some people do not want to listen at all. It's just in one year and out the other. Yeah, I don't know Gary for sure, uh, but he seemed like one of those types where he has his argument. He's going to be obdurate to the point uh, of just e extremity. There's a ton of people out there that they care much more about being right and winning the debate than they do about actually learning and understanding a nuanced viewpoint that they might not share. So I take it in and go, wow, this is the bear case. I'm not convinced. I think that credit risk, 100% what he said, is the biggest problem with SoFi. We have, a, we have a ton of risk, but that is banking. That's the lending side of this company. And you know he can say that the underwriters, he, he doesn't see the secret sauce, but that's also, that goes in both directions. What makes them a weak underwriter? What makes them a great underwriter? So far, they've been great. I'm gonna lean towards what, what they've done historically. No, but like, I think a better conversation would be if you go from the bullish side to the middle, and if Gary goes from the bearer side to the middle, and then you have common ground and you find things that you can both agree on, very simply, hey, are we seeing the same chart? I know what language they speak, and they do not speak members, products, anything. It means nothing to them. There's a reason why JP Morgan and Wells Fargo and all these companies do not talk about their cross-selling or their member counts is because they're probably extremely stagnant just because it doesn't look good anymore. That's that's them hyping. I want to show a chart off really quick. This is from, from Growth to Value. Where in SoFi's lifespan would you place SoFi on this chart? I think it's pretty clear. 
probably in high growth going from loss to profit. This is the hard thing that whenever you're talking about value investors or people that are valuing this like a bank versus others is it's very hard to talk whenever they're focused on this loss portion right here saying we are a losing company. We're out of that stage now. We're about right here in the business. And it's hard to project this whenever people just don't believe that. Growth sure. investors want to focus on this part of the business. Value investors are focused on this part of the business. I've seen this in similar places too. Price to earnings, that's a good metric or even the peg ratio. But uh, you, you can get stuck on one uh, valuation measure. By the way, it says they're price free cash flow in the next stage. If people are valuing SoFi as a bank with price to free cash flow, they don't know how banks work. You, you no, got to... Yeah. Look at it from all different angles, do your due diligence, make sure you know what you're buying. And that way, if the stock price drops and the company's the same, you're like this is on sell versus we saw from Ortex this week that short interest is likely going to come in at another record. 173 million shares sold short, about 20% of the float. You know, what is going on here, guys? Short interest seems to be increasing every two weeks. Yet we're releasing news around the company that is still executing and we're driving towards first quarter profitability, 40 to 60 million in savings to the bottom line from uh, interest that they would have otherwise paid on preferred shares. Despite all that, shorts keep piling on to the stock. What pisses me off is the entire gambit of those analysts who even after Noto finished his mad money interview with Kramer, like later that night, Compass Point released their, their you know, we maintain a $4 price target. Like the reason why it matters is because short interest is so high. From a shorts perspective, I've been trying to think about it. And whenever it comes to AMC, GameStop, these sorts of plays, is there a time that you guys can remember where shorts have won in trading a company down that is a pretty strong grower? They tried to do that with Palantir. It went down the short term. Now shorts are getting destroyed because they continuously put out beats. Tesla, they tried doing that. You know, shorts got absolutely crushed because of those continuous beats. Where do we see like this quote unquote shorts winning? Like even if short percent gets to 50% and we continue to follow this company and see that, you know, some of the trends are not turning around, they continue to go positive. There has to be an influx to try to crush those shorts. Am I, am I wrong in thinking that? If they continue executing, then it's just a matter of time before they cover. Um, right. And quite a few probably made quite, quite a bit of money. Congratulations. Shorting does hurt a company, especially if they need to raise capital. You know, if, if SoFi was not heavily shorted coming in uh, to the senior convertible notes, they would have had a better deal. Reality is what happened. And of course, shorts, I think, probably doubled down. They're like, hey, this is an opportunity. I would actually, at this point, the, the company is so low as far as the share price. Uh, for From what I, my perspective is, I, I would love it if shorts spiked to 30%, 40%. It just, it's a matter of time. They have to execute. But at a certain point, it just stops making sense. If I was somebody that was on the sidelines up to this point, and I looked at the company and I said, hey, you know, it's, it's $7 and some change. I would be scared to touch it as a short. It's free for me to hold on to shares. It's not free for them to hold on to their shorts. Right now, it's a lot of just retail traders. But we saw in the last quarter, whenever we saw uh, institutional trades, you're starting to buy in. Even if Wall Street right now is shorting this company, if Wall Street gets a sniff, because Wall Street's not a big conglomerate, it's, it's many different players and they're all versus each other. If a part of them gets a sniff that there could be a short squeeze in here, I promise you they'll, they'll participate on the upside as well. I'm like running out of, justifications to try to steel man the the short case throughout time it's been okay well we might go into a hard landing situation therefore people are shorting it makes sense you know so if i might have high defaults it makes sense for shorts and then i said okay well probably not going to go into a hard landing but so if i still not profitable it's um, you know the execution risk it makes sense i even saw this argument this week to say that well obviously bank of america and a lot like goldman and these institutions knew that that May was coming up to renew their 12.5% mm. preferred shares. And so they would be shorting going into that event because they know that that's going to bring the stock down when they issue the convertible notes. Even Anthony Noto mentioned that on, on Kramer uh, in passing. And so it makes sense. I even had a justification to say, okay, well, shorts want to keep it low so that they can keep buying more shares. And yet we've been trading in this channel for so long that right now going into Q1, and as we expect profitability, you know, over the next, what is it, a month away from earnings, 
you know, I'm running out of reasons and the short interest keeps rising, I can't make a case for it anymore. Whereas over the past two years, I could feasibly make a case as to say, you know, for all of these reasons at different points in time, yeah, I understand how someone would be short. The margins are the important part of the business. If those continue to go up, especially in Q1, I, uh, I'm very confident. I recently saw Michael Perito, that's who it was. They did the $6.50 price target on, on SoFi a little bit ago. And the main reason was that interest rates cutting is going to actually lower the coupon rates of the personal loans and SoFi is going to end up making less interest income. And now that rates are staying for longer, people are like, well, SoFi is going to, you know, have a hard time continuing to sell their student loans. And, you know, it's not good for banks in a lowering interest rate environment. It's like, guys, come on. Can I want the conclusion to be I am short. Find some convoluted path to conclude there. They were successful in a low rate environment. They were also successful in a high rate environment, different segments of their business, guys. Now it's like you can't have your cake and eat it too. Oh, well, if it's a low rate environment, you could just as easily make the argument that, that they're going to be successful as you can that they're going to be not successful and vice versa for if we're in a higher rate environment. Take your pick, pick a lane. When I encounter people that are basically like, hey, no matter what, I'm going to find this little piece of data for confirmation bias. I just say, you know what? It's not worth my time. Uh, if you want to short the company, please short it. I encourage you to do that. Double down, triple down, send it down to four bucks. If it's the exact same company as we have right now, I would love SoFi at $4. What was the first couple of questions that Kramer asked? Why is the stock at $7? What are you doing for the stock price? This is what investors would say. Your stock should be trading at $10. I get people calling me all the time. Why are we so low? For better or for worse, I do think his questions represented a level that in my mind is emblematic of the average retail investor. On right? purpose. Like, on purpose, yeah. He's trying to channel that retail investor. And Anthony Noto was like, dude, it's good for our business. We make money. We saw an opportunity with a different position of Strength. And then Kramer towards the end of the interview was like, okay, that all makes sense. But like, why is the stock still low? Like you could see them at a disconnect there because Anthony Noto just cares about the business and Kramer cares about the stock. I think it's hard for the CEO of a regulated bank now to pump stock. He's coming out and talking product. I don't think he can come on and do what Alex Karp does. They're in different arenas. And he shouldn't. It's a very retail focused show uh, for Kramer. He actually lobbed a lot of softballs. I think he really likes and respects Noto. There's no legitimate interview that you can have in six minutes. And that's the duration of that entire segment. If you can get three good sound bites, it's a win, man. Pack it up. You can understand that when you listen to how fast Noto is talking. He completely understands and he's just trying to bang through it before it's on to the next clip. Anthony Noto tried to help clarify some questions that this is not necessarily bad. Yes, there will be some negligible amount of dilution, but dilution is not the only thing if it's going to help you actually make more money than you know, you you end up diluting. So can we yeah. spend 30 seconds talking about the 60 million? Because I thought that was the most interesting part. We were all looking at the 12.5% preferred shares that they were getting rid of. And that was about 40 million. Mm -hmm. or, and then he said, there's another 500 million outstanding debt that would result in up to 60 million in savings down to the bottom line. 60 million is what, five cents EPS, something like that. Like that's almost the entirety of what analysts were expecting SoFi to come in for full year revenue. It's going to be interesting to see what they come in at Q1 for EPS, because that's going to set the tone for what the rest of the year is going to be. You can't have an analyst in their right mind, aside from maybe David Cavarini and whatever his face, Bologna, who have five cent EPS price targets for the year if SoFi comes in at three cents EPS for Q1. Like they just look like freaking idiots out there. And yeah. I believe yeah. it's pronounced baloney. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go. I want to do the SoFi Weekly After Hours. It's going to be extra long, extra fun.